Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, this is Majid Al Munif. I am the president of the Saudi Association for Energy Economics. Uh, I'm here in my office in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, that's why I am addressed in, as you can see, in our national summer dress or summer attire. Uh, there's on behalf of the International Association for Energy Economics and the Saudi affiliate, as well as the King Abdullah Energy Studies and Research Center, CAPSAC, I welcome you to this session on the circular carbon economy. I would like first to congratulate the French organizers of the 2021 online IAEE conference and hope that once we meet for the 2022 IAEE conference in Tokyo, the world would be recovered from the pandemic and the global economy is back to normal and the international gatherings such as this one are more hybrid than virtual. The Saudi affiliate of the IAEE is pleased and privileged to be the organizer of the 2023 conference in the first week of February of that year. This will be the first IAEE conference in our part of the world, and we, in collaboration with CAPSAC, are excited to host the IAEE conference in Riyadh and welcome you all to that event. The Saudi Association for Energy Economics, which was established in the city of Dahran, that's in the Eastern province, became an uh, IAEE affiliate in 2009 and enjoyed for more than a decade the support from the national oil company Saudi Aramco. But uh, since last year, the association has been restructured and moved to the capital city, Riyadh, with CAPSAC as its strategic partner. We continue to be guided by the objectives and governance of the association. Uh, since 2019, we have been active in co-sponsoring regional Middle East and North Africa's conferences, MENA, which commenced in Abu Dhabi in that year and set to meet in Bahrain later on this year. We will be meet, meeting next year in Morocco. Uh, we, along with our partners in the countries of the region, are committed to continue holding such MENA conferences annually to bring together the researchers and professionals in energy economics from the region and beyond. Before giving the floor to the session's moderator, Dr. Noura Mansouri, who is also a member of uh, the Saudi Association of Energy Economics Council, I would like to share with you a short video about the Saudi energy sector and the co-sponsors of the 2023 IAEE conference, the Saudi affiliate and Capsack. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. To inform and support policymaking, the Saudi Association for Energy Economics was launched in 2020 to advance the knowledge base on the productivity of energy resources and energy utilization and support capacity building and capabilities of professionals within the energy ecosystem and the kingdom as a whole. SAEE will achieve its aims by focusing on disseminating evidence-based research and engaging in technical and policy-level dialogue to support and inform policy and decision-making among stakeholders. SAEE aims to inform and support 
improved policies and industry practices that are contextualized and relevant, which can achieve positive economic and environmental goals. SAEE will engage with partners and stakeholders to promote open discussion on policy issues that can improve the environmental, economic and sustainable performance of energy systems in Saudi, the region and the world. Partners, including think tanks like the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center, which aims to foster dialogue and evidence-based research and design and deliver resources and tools that could inform decisions. SAEE strives to become a leading partner that engages with energy economists, practitioners, and policymakers working towards sustainable energy solutions. We want to use this opportunity to invite you to participate in the annual International Conference for Energy Economics hosted by the IAEE here in Saudi Arabia in 2023. Hello and welcome to the first IAEE online conference of 2021 in the afternoon parallel session 2.2. Uh, my name is Noura Mansouri. I'm a research fellow at CAPSARC, a research affiliate at MIT, and a founding member and board member of the SAEE. It is my pleasure to be your moderator today. The seminar, co-sponsored by the Saudi Association of Energy Economics and the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center on the Circular Carbon Economy, aims to raise awareness of Saudi Arabia's initiatives to combat climate change. The seminar will provide an introduction about the IAEE chapters in the GCC and the MENA region and the Saudi Association for Energy Economics, provide a brief on the circular carbon economy framework and its importance in managing carbon emissions, showcase progress in the adoption of the CCE framework globally, and discuss applications of the CCE framework in the kingdom, as well as align the key requirements for promoting the framework further. Under the Saudi G20 presidency, Saudi Arabia proposed the circular carbon economy, endorsed in the 2020 G20 leaders declaration by all the G20 countries as a holistic, integrated, inclusive, and pragmatic approach to managing emissions based on the four Rs. By encompassing the broad range of pathways and options available, CCE considers different national circumstances while striving to meet our shared global aspirations. The key importance for reducing greenhouse gases, considering system efficiency and national circumstances, including its specific resources endowment and its political, economic, social, environmental, and risk-informed development contexts. CCE is an energy strategy that advocates the three R's of environmentalism, reduce, reuse, recycle, and uh, 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 recycle carbon. Crucially, however, it adds a fourth R, remove, in an effort to eliminate emissions from the atmosphere, making the four R's of CCE, reduce, reuse, recycle, and remove. For sustainable energy transitions, utilization of all energy sources and innovative technologies will offer opportunities to further advance cleaner energy transitions. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome our esteemed panelists, Mr. Adam Siminski, president of CAPSARC, who will talk about the new energy landscape, the role of the circular carbon economy, Dr. Gassim Fallata, the advisor to the Minister of Energy of Saudi Arabia, who will talk about the CCE framework implementation nationally and internationally. Dr. Ahmed Asinan, business development specialist at Saudi Aramco, who will give an overview on priorities uh, CCE technologies, hydrogen. And Professor Carlos Duarte, distinguished professor of marine science at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, who will talk about the fourth R, remove natural-based solutions. With all, without further ado, I'll give the floor to Mr. Adam Siminski. Thank you, Nora. I think they're going to play the video now.
Thank you, Nora, and thank you also to the Association for Energy Economics uh, France uh, for organizing uh, the entire uh, workshop series. Uh, I'd like to give an overview of the circular carbon economy concept. It's generally agreed that climate change uh, as a result uh, of uh, rising temperatures uh, is a very important crucial global issue. Uh, temperatures have risen by more than a degree uh, Celsius since mid 20th century. The scientific community has declared this to be a significant problem if we don't take aggressive actions uh, to reduce emissions. And global leaders uh, have pledged, uh, particularly at Paris in 2015, to limit uh, the global temperature rise uh, this century to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels. The, there are many pathways uh, to accomplish uh, this uh, goal. Uh, we believe that a narrow focus on uh, simply uh, reducing fossil fuels could lead to significant and undesirable socioeconomic consequences. Uh, in many sectors, there is no practical solution to abate uh, uh, emissions. Aviation, shipping, heavy duty trucking, uh, cement, uh, and metal smelting, for example. There could also be issues associated with reduced energy access. And one of the key objectives of the United Nations uh, SDGs is to uh, improve access to modern energy uh, for um, everybody uh, that doesn't have uh, complete access now. The third and critical area is from an economic standpoint, uh, we have a lot of infrastructure associated with uh, hydrocarbon fuels and the uh, premature abandonment of uh, things like ports, pipelines, power plants, and so on would lead to significant costs. Uh, there is a, a way that we think, uh, a pathway that can achieve uh, the Paris uh, Agreement goals, uh, but in a, uh, in a more holistic and practical uh, way that uses all options to address CO2 uh, and other greenhouse gas emissions, maybe even generating value for the economy. You know, we started off many years ago with the idea of a linear economy and in, in the energy area that was just produce it and burn it, combust. Uh, we then moved to the idea of a circular economy or three R's, uh, reducing, reusing and recycling. And in the linear economy uh, and even the circular economy, it deals with material flows. A new idea emerged uh, uh, recently, and that's the circular carbon economy. And now we focus on energy flows and how to deal with those and add a fourth R or remove. If you think about all four of these R's, uh, this broadens the opportunity set available to deal with carbon emissions. Uh, reduce options include things like energy efficiency and renewable energy, uh, nuclear energy, uh, and certainly all of these uh, options are uh, dramatically supported uh, in Saudi Arabia and many other countries around the world. Um, reuse and recycle includes things like supercritical CO2, enhanced oil uh, recovery, uh, carbon to chemicals, carbon to fuels, and carbon to other materials. Uh, adding this fourth R remove uh, allows uh, emerging technologies like direct air capture, uh, the work that's already being done uh, around the world on uh, carbon storage, and even nature-based solutions as additional options to deal uh, with uh, this uh, powerful greenhouse gas. In order to explain uh, these options further, uh, last year, CAPSARC worked with a number of leading international organizations, the IEA, 
uh, the International Renewable uh, Energy Agency, uh, the Nuclear Energy Agency, the Global CCS Institute, and the OECD Policy Office to write a series of reports on carbon management that form the CCE guide uh, to the four R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, and remove. This is all available for free on the cceguide.org website. It presents a series uh, of, of reports with practical information for policymakers to understand the challenges and the opportunities that are presented within each of these elements and it includes some cross-cutting issues uh, like hydrogen uh, and the policy uh, changes that might be needed uh, to really advance uh, the technologies associated with the circular carbon economy. In November uh, of last year, the G20 uh, summit leaders endorsed the idea of the circular carbon economy platform. Uh, they recognized uh, that this was an important uh, way to reduce emissions that would take into uh, the national circumstances associated with uh, many uh, countries uh, who might not be normally associated uh, with the reduce only uh, idea. The CCE is voluntary, it's integrated, it's pragmatic, and it's complementary to economic growth in our view, but it still allows for enhanced economic and environmental stewardship. Uh, the other development uh, that uh, occurred at the climate summit, which was held in Washington uh, recently, is the formation of a new uh, international institution dedicated to developing long-term strategies to reach global net zero emissions. The net zero producers forum includes Canada, Norway, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the United States. These countries collectively represent uh, 40 percent of global oil and gas production, and they are looking at four uh, key areas. Development of methane abatement strategies. Methane is another uh, important uh, greenhouse gas uh, in addition to carbon uh, dioxide. Advancing the idea of the circular carbon economy approach. Uh, developing and deploying clean energy and carbon capture and storage technologies and also diversifying uh, economies away from uh, uh, high reliance on hydrocarbon revenues as, as a, uh, a main driver of the economy. Uh, the Net Zero Producers Forum, I think, will offer uh, an opportunity for discussion of other pathways associated uh, with uh, dealing with greenhouse gas emissions that go beyond simply focusing on demand alone. Uh, finally, I wanted to uh, just mention uh, the idea of implementing the circular carbon uh, economy framework, uh, both globally and here uh, in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. There are three key areas, technology, policy, and markets. Uh, in technology, advancing uh, R&D and pilot projects uh, policy, finding enabling mechanisms for the deployment of CCE technologies. And in markets, uh, among the key things, is developing robust measurement, reporting, and verification systems. And to uh, delve more deeply uh, into the idea of the circular carbon economy framework, uh, our next speaker, uh, Gassem uh, Falata, will uh, discuss the international and national uh, framework. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. And uh, um, really, uh, I think it is uh, great to uh, jump in to uh, my uh, little speech uh, following yours, because uh, I think it is just a continuation uh, on uh, the same theme. So uh, let me really get into it. Uh, 
Adam uh, already mentioned about a uh, circular carbon uh, uh, initiative or uh, program or national program that we have really uh, get the circular carbon economy. And uh, what, what I will be really doing over here is really kind of to give uh, uh, some uh, little bit more information uh, about uh, the program. Uh, the efforts that is really being uh, put, uh, be it uh, here uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, or the efforts that we are really trying also really to put forward uh, uh, globally. So uh, just to kind of really maybe brief into uh, the concept of the circular carbon economy is uh, an effort uh, that we have really uh, initiated and I will show the timeline of uh, uh, showing it. Uh, kind of uh, progressing and emerging, but it is really a comprehensive uh, framework uh, and uh, we believe that it can be really adapted uh, globally. Um, looking at this, uh, what we call the strategy house of uh, the circular carbon economy, we would notice that we are really uh, kind of covering uh, almost all uh, concerned uh, sectors. Uh, so, uh, be it the oil and gas, uh, utilities, manufacturing, transportation, as well as agricultural, and uh, going across the four R's that have been really very much uh, introduced by uh, Adam, and really trying to cover uh, almost uh, every application within uh, these sectors. Not only focusing uh, on uh, that technology uh, side of it uh, across the four R's, but we do believe in order for us to have a comprehensive framework that will be really successful, there is a set of enablers that needs to be really actioned and played uh, in order really for it to be uh, successful. So across the enablers, uh, we do believe uh, one very important uh, enabler is really the engagement and communication. And I do believe uh, talking today uh, about the circular carbon economy and explaining it is really one form of the communication that we are really trying to do. We do believe that finance is really uh, very important because uh, in order for us to uh, really achieve uh, our aim uh, by implementing uh, this framework and reaching to the abatement levels that we would like really uh, all to, uh, to reach, uh, there got to be really some financial uh, enablement, particularly with those technologies that are yet to be mature and financially visible for it really to be uh, kind of utilized. Uh, policy and legal, Adam indicated that definitely uh, there got to be really changes from the current status that we are really uh, into. Infrastructure, uh, lots of infrastructure needs to be really made available for the different industries to utilize. And in order to be also cost effective, there got to be really these kind of uh, commonality and utilization of some of the uh, infrastructure. The human capital is really a very important uh, enabler. Um, we don't really have uh, many of the schools that have really people that are really specialized in this kind of uh, area. So there got to be really uh, a focus given to the human capital that will help drive such a, such a kind of uh, uh, initiative uh, for us to reach to uh, our uh, objectives. Finally, we do believe really technical information and sharing of the technical information is really a key uh, uh, enabler because varies, it varies between uh, different countries, different experiences. Sharing this kind of uh, uh, information is gonna be really very much useful for us really to uh, enable the success uh, of uh, such an initiative. Now, just to give you a little uh, kind of overview of a journey of a circular carbon uh, uh, initiative or uh, that we have got the national program. The idea uh, started uh, almost about two years ago. Uh, and it was uh, the vision uh, of uh, the His Royal Highness, the Minister of Energy, who delivered the speech on circular carbon economy. Uh, and that was really back uh, in October, 2019. And uh, from there, the idea really started. We had uh, what we call the program uh, kind of uh, concepts being really uh, built. Uh, around beginning of uh, 2020. 
Uh, and during that time, there have been a lot of debate on the framework itself, the strategic objectives. Uh, is it really domestic uh, and or international? Well, we really believe that, uh, that it got to be really something that is uh, to be adapted really uh, globally. Uh, so a lot of uh, engagement and defining role and responsibilities. Stage three was really more focused around the design of the program and uh, putting uh, some uh, more details on uh, how it will be kind of really manifest and move forward. And I will show some details in the coming slides around that. Uh, also uh, working on some of the initiatives, uh, which also we will be really showing uh, uh, some examples for. What would be the metrics? We need to be able really to, to measure. What would be the targets that we would like really to achieve? Uh, what are the funding mechanisms? We were talking about the enablers. So what are those mechanisms? How would you really play it in order for it to be really successful? As well as the international engagement. As I said, in order for a circular carbon economy uh, program to be successful or the framework itself to be successful, it got to be really adapted internationally. Well, going further, uh, forward is really the program uh, launch uh, that we would like really to go. And I believe again, such a kind of communication is really part of our effort to make it uh, more uh, kind of visible. Uh, also, there is really work being done and accelerating some of the implementation uh, cases, which we will be maybe uh, showing some uh, examples for also activating some of the enablers that have been really uh, designed. And this is really a phase that we are kind of busy uh, nowadays to finalize and really get uh, moving forward with. Now, to give you an idea uh, about the effort that has been put, uh, at least on uh, the technologies that have been scanned and uh, been analyzed, uh, across the four hours uh, of a circular carbon economy, um, 57 key uh, emission reducing technologies were really kind of uh, uh, looked at, uh, brought arise, uh, analyzed. And just to give you a flavor uh, on an effort that has been really put, if we look at the reduce and remove uh, kind of billers and look at the technologies that uh, have been really considered, uh, across the abatement potential and the cause that they have got and the maturity uh, of that technology, uh, we would really uh, kind of see it very visible in this kind of heat map that we have uh, conducted in which we were trying to um, really identify what would be the right technology, the right, uh, the right approach that we should do uh, and really link it to uh, in cost as well as the abatement uh, potential that it, uh, it has got. Out of this uh, great effort and work that has been done in reviewing those technologies, we come out with three action categories uh, for the brutalized technologies. A group that is still uh, under the R&D uh, kind of domain, and it needs to be really uh, kind of natured and developed further. Uh, a group that is in the scale up uh, because of their high potential uh, technological, and they do have significant abatement. So they need to be really uh, implemented, scaled, uh, scaled up, so it can be really uh, uh, used more and more. And the third group is really those commercial readily available uh, group of technologies that can be really immediately employed for the purpose uh, that we are all aiming at. So this is really a nice summary of an effort that has been put on the technology uh, domain. Now, to walk the talk and really push through some of the implementation cases on the ground, Across the four hours, here is an example of some uh, of uh, already uh, implementing, uh, implemented uh, technologies and uh, initiatives that we are working on. So under a reduce, we have already really started uh, long ago uh, the energy efficiency program, 
which we are continuing to, uh, to, to use as a main driver for the reduce, as well as uh, working on the liquid fuel displacement uh, in which we aim by 2030 to have our energy mix by converting up to 50% of a liquid uh, to gas and the renewable energy. Uh, also on the green uh, hydrogen, uh, we know that it's, the work is really uh, going on uh, with uh, our very ambitious NEOM uh, project uh, to produce a green uh, hydrogen. Uh, similarly, under the reduced couple of initiatives that are really going on, uh, the recycle and the remove, uh, these are all areas that we have already really started uh, working on. Now, to look at the program itself and the way uh, it is being structured and how we are really uh, working uh, as a kind of uh, one team in there, three uh, different subgroups or teams that are really working, one focus uh, around the technology or the technical team, we call it, and that is really the team uh, that has get us uh, the previous slides that I have shown. The enablers team, uh, as I mentioned from my first slide, we do need to have enablement for this framework, for those technologies, for them really to uh, be activated. So there is a team that is really very much focused around uh, articulating those mechanisms for el, uh, el enablement, be it el funding, be it a business model that we would like really to, to work, as well as them responsible for uh, monitoring uh, uh, the, the emission and taking care of the metrics. The third team, which is really very uh, important and critical, is uh, the engagement team, which is taking care of showcasing the CCE framework, but more importantly, also uh, working into those multilateral and bilateral engagements through which we are managing our collaboration with uh, uh, different entities globally to promote uh, the concept of the circular uh, carbon uh, economy. Uh, on the enabler, and just to give you a flavor of the effort that, uh, that is really undergoing uh, in the enablers, we almost really consider all kind of uh, enablers that can be uh, exercised and employed uh, for the success uh, of, uh, of the initiative itself. So between some voluntary uh, rollout as well as some government support and push uh, mechanisms or uh, models, uh, if you wish. And uh, we are uh, now really busy uh, trying to um, kind of make the story uh, an engineer, if you wish, uh, the different enablers and make them really kind of work together for uh, the big result that we would like uh, to achieve uh, at the end. Uh, last but not least, I would like really to shed light on a recent initiative, uh, and we do believe it is a continuation uh, of our efforts for managing a mission, which is the Saudi Green Initiative, as well as the Middle East uh, uh, Green uh, Initiative. Uh, through which a circular carbon economy is uh, a key uh, element and we are promoting further uh, an agenda of a circular carbon economy through, uh, through these uh, two uh, initiatives. Uh, with that, I end uh, my uh, part of the presentation. I'll turn it to the next speaker. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for uh, the invitation. I'm very glad to present to you today um, an overview on priority CC technologies and particularly the hydrogen, as hydrogen and CCUS uh, have been identified as two focus areas or two focus technologies within our uh, national circular carbon economy framework. I would like to uh, shed some light on, uh, on the hydrogen uh, overview. So if we move on to the first slide, please. Just to set the scene before I go <clears throat> deeper into the, uh, the hydrogen technology, I would like to first present to you uh, a simple form of the circular carbon economy framework, 
So really the, the CCE is, is about changing our mindset from a culture of make it, break it and throw it away to one of reuse and recycle. So this is really about transforming the linear to circular carbon economy and closing this, the, the carbon cycle. Here we show uh, an overall uh, framework of circular carbon economy in the oil and gas industry sector, uh, where CO2 is really emitted from oil and gas operations and product end uses in various sectors and segments. CO2 is then is captured and recycled into chemicals. Uh, CO2 uh, from a hydrogen plant can also be captured to produce uh, blue hydrogen or blue ammonia. And then it can be captured and recycled into e-fuels using hydrogen produced from, let's say, renewable water electrolysis. It can be captured and sequestered permanent, permanently uh, under the ground or naturally through the refrigeration. As part of the circular carbon economy, the oil and gas industry uh, can be uh, leveraged or it can actually leverage various technologies and solutions. Uh, as you can imagine, there are still various R&D innovations needed to achieve the cost reductions specifically uh, cost elements associated with the hydrogen production, uh, the CCUS, and of course, the last mile or the delivery to the end users. Next one, please. The significant growth in the energy demand with increasing population and access to energy really mandates us to come up with technologies or alternatives in the different segments or industries. In fact, 50% population growth is expected between now to 2100. With Africa and Asia, as you can see, the population in Africa and Asia increasing by more than 1.6 billion in the next 20 years. So this population growth, as you can imagine, would be accompanied by energy demand growth and equal access to energy and electricity as well. As Africa and Asia today account for most of the population growth without access to electricity. Next one, please. Uh, the energy growth as well will be, will be uh, accompanied by several challenges as we move on uh, to more and more of a sustainable and equitable world. The current energy system, as you can see, is mainly based on a supply from fossil fuels with around 80%, where the solid lines here represent the direct use of natural resources and the dashed or dotted lines are the use of natural resources through a conversion process, mainly electricity in this case. So there are various pathways that can take us into the future with more and more, uh, sorry, more or less CO2 emissions, depending on the scenarios as set by the world energy outlook. Uh, moreover, the world would really be needing to address uh, issues related to local air quality concerns and afford uh, access to energy. Next one, please. Given all of these challenges and the, the growth in the energy demand, hydrogen can really play a vital role in the energy in the future energy system, which can interconnect and stabilize the, the, the current energy grid. Hydrogen can be or can form actually a linkage, either as a hydrogen molecule or as an, air, an energy provider and a major building block for synthetic uh, gaseous or liquid fuels even. Next one, please. Just to give an example where hydrogen can really play a role in different uh, sectors, uh, power, residential, industry, and transport, I would like to give here a, a, an example, uh, a great demonstration of, of a practical example, actually. This is the Liverpool Manchester Hydrogen Cluster Project proposed by the Cadnet. It's a good concept which demonstrates a practical and economic framework to introduce hydrogen into an existing gas network, in this case, in the Liverpool, Manchester area. The concept really relies on hydrogen network that can feed into gas network to supply various household and industry. The hydrogen can be produced from, let's say, natural gas with CO2 being captured uh, to offer more flexibility to the grid and also provide better economics as hydrogen production from electrolysis is still being costly as we speak. Such concept really proves that the coexistence or the seamless integration of hydrogen is possible into existing energy systems such as this one. Uh, next one. 
In fact, hydrogen can also help decarbonize the resident residential sector, as I uh, showed earlier. When hydrogen is used in power, it would really reduce indirectly the household carbon intensity of lightening and air conditioning mainly in the residential sector. When added to the gas network, hydrogen would also produce the carbon intensity of heating and cooking, for example. It can also be used as a fuel to provide combined heat and power or reduce directly the household emissions. Uh, if we move on to the next one, we see also that hydrogen is a perfect solution to decarbonize the difficult industries. Uh, the industrial sector really relies mostly on heat uh, at different grades, as you can imagine. And as electricity usage is marginal, except for example, in this case, in the aluminum industry, hydrogen can be combusted to provide, let's say, required heat and substitute fossil-based fuels in many of the industrial processes where alternative energies uh, or alternative energy usage is, is limited. It would be possible, of course, to rethink the industrial processes to directly use and consume hydrogen, as in the case, for example, of the uh, direct reduction, iron direct reduction with hydrogen. Whether as a fuel or as a feedstock, hydrogen can certainly help decarbonize, uh, difficult to decarbonize sectors. Let's take, for example, now the transport sector. In the transport sector, this diagram uh, shows uh, greatly how the hydrogen can play a significant role in transport, among other alternatives. For example, as battery electric, battery electric vehicles are leading the way now for small duty vehicles, under the, especially under the zero emission vehicle umbrella, the battery electric vehicles still lack the energy density and range to be economically perfect viable option for larger applications. Let's say, for example, for medium and large, uh, large vehicles or heavy duty, or also even for fleet and taxis, where really there is a high demand uh, of range. Um, a significant mileage is really required in those applications. And uh, that's really where most of the demand is taking place. Uh, considering the latest development in the, in the fuel cell technology and hydrogen production technology, hydrogen, we can see that hydrogen can play a major role in the transport sector to complement the battery electric vehicles in some segments like the light duty, but also challenge, challenge the battery electric vehicles in, in, in more difficult applications or segments, such as the heavy duty ones. This presents an opportunity for uh, major oil and gas companies to position themselves and establish themselves as major suppliers of hydrogen to the transport sector and potentially even offer oil-based or hydrocarbon-based hydrogen as a ZEF alternative in the road transport to capture this growing uh, market opportunity. Next one. If we look at uh, today's market, we see actually that more than 90% of the global hydrogen is being supplied from hydrocarbon feedstocks. And most of this is really intended for local usage as we speak. Uh, more than 50 million tons are produced annually using commercial technologies such as reforming, uh, gasification, or even to certain limit, electrolysis, with ammonia being uh, ammonia production being uh, uh, major, uh, followed by refining industry and methanol production. Next one. If we look at the whole value chain of the hydrogen, we see that there is really a, a need for major development in the infrastructure and coming up with innovative business models. Uh, if we move on to the global hydrogen economy and trading, we see that we can, we, we, in order to, to, for this market to materialize, there has to be some uh, major infrastructure development and major business models, as well as uh, a need to investigate the whole, the whole value chain starting from the feedstock production of the hydrogen as all the way to the end use applications. The different elements of the value chain, of course, as you can imagine, are still at different maturity levels. As an example, the, the trans-ocean hydrogen transport is not yet established. And, you know, major companies and, and, and countries are yet to investigate and demonstrate different routes to transport hydrogen from uh, the production location to the demand location overseas. 
which would require uh, different carriers such as the liquid hydrogen or even organic molecules such as the methyl cyclohexane or ammonia. Once at, this at the destination country, hydrogen needs also to be extracted from those carriers for final consumption or usage. <clears throat> in the case, for example, of ammonia or uh, methyl cyclohexane, or even in the liquid hydrogen would require regasification to produce hydrogen again and use those molecules in the different applications. Lastly, I would like to mention that uh, uh, in the kingdom, uh, we have already demonstrated parts of the hydrogen supply chain. If we move on to the last slide, uh, in fact, we have already built and inaugurated uh, a hydrogen fueling station in Bahrain Techno Valley, which is now serving a small fleet of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and buses uh, in, in Aramco and, and Bahrain area. But we're also now planning to um, uh, build or develop a future hydrogen fueling station where we generate and produce the hydrogen on site using different feedstocks such as heavy naphtha, LPG, or even natural gas. We have also demonstrated the use uh, uh, and experienced the use of the fuel cell buses and the heavy duty vehicles in the kingdom. Um, and yet there is still uh, uh, many areas uh, of research where we need to, uh, to demonstrate in order to build this economy further and bring it to a commercial stage in the kingdom. With that, I end my presentation and thank you very much for, uh, for your time. I would like to contribute to the discussion of the circular carbon economy by uh, talking about nature-based solutions and the role they play in supporting one of the fourth arts, which is uh, remove. So climatic stability in the earth system uh, was achieved by a closed loop circular carbon economy, which we call the global carbon cycle, by which a photosynthesis on land and ocean takes up about 780 gigatons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, transform this into organic uh, carbon, and this supports growth and reproduction of organisms, while respiration then releases the energy contained in this organic matter to support all of the processes that the organisms uh, need to support, and then return an equivalent amount, about 780 gigatons carbon dioxide, back to the atmosphere. So this loop, the carbon cycle, is the fundamental engine of life, and its function it depends on the abundance of life, which is the natural capital that supports the functioning of the biosphere. So this uh, couple production respiration loop of the carbon cycle, which we can think of as being the metabolism of the biosphere, is an essential component of the supraorganismal uh, homeostatic uh, regulation of the biosphere that we sometimes refer, uh, re refer to as the Gaia hypothesis that confers climatic stability. So over the last 800,000 years, then the atmosphere has uh, shown oscillations of carbon dioxide along relatively narrow margins, but still climatically relevant from about 180 ppm to about 300 ppm. But then due to human release of greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide, the concentration of carbon dioxide can, has really increased beyond these limits over the past 150 years to now reach about 416 ppm. So we are now away from this uh, narrow oscillation of carbon dioxide that maintain a climate stability nearly uh, a million years. So recognizing the importance of achieving a balance between emissions and removal of carbon dioxide, the Paris Agreement in the Article 4 pledges to achieve a balance between anthropogenic emissions by sources and removal by sinks of greenhouse gases by the second half of the 21st century. So this really means uh, to embed a society, uh, the process of carbon by society within the rules of nature, which is a circular carbon economy. And this uh, is something that I welcome because uh, it really shows that humans cannot really operate as separate from nature. We need to embed our operations within the rules of nature, and that is in terms of carbon, within the circular carbon economy that uh, propels the, the global carbon cycle. 
So if we go uh, now to the circular carbon economy, and I'm sorry about this VC diagram, but basically shows the circular carbon economy in terms of how we manage uh, carbon in products and also how we manage uh, biological carbon. So basically we can see the need to reduce uh, emissions. Uh, we can see also the role of reuse and recycle of materials in reducing emissions, but then supporting these three R's that is importantly remove, which means to remove carbon dioxide that is already uh, released in the atmosphere. And this can be done by technology fixes as discussed earlier, by which we can remove carbon dioxide through direct air carbon technologies, but also through direct carbon capture technologies at point sources where this carbon is being released and then reuse this carbon or store it, store this carbon safely. But alongside this uh, technology fixes, the source of family of uh, remove uh, solutions are actually based on nature-based solutions. And those are the ones I would like to focus the rest of my presentation. So if we zoom into nature-based solutions, this can be defined as an approach to decarbonize the atmosphere. That means remove the excess carbon dioxide that is already present in the atmosphere by recarbonizing the biosphere and increasing the amount of living carbon in the biosphere. Because remind, remember, we have lost about half of the forest, a historical forest extent in the biosphere, and also half of many other important ecosystems with a role as carbon sinks, such as mangrove sea grasses and uh, sun marshes. So uh, nature-based solutions restore the abundance of life on land and oceans. And in doing so, they also restore uh, uh, carbon sinks and contribute to decarbonize the atmosphere. So the earliest uh, contribution to nature-based solutions was focused on afforestation and forest ecosystem restoration and management that uh, continues to be one pathway of deploying nature-based solutions but also the restoration of coastal wetlands, including the mangrove, seagrasses, and salt marshes, which we collectively call blue carbon, has emerged as a very powerful contribution to nature-based solutions to mitigate climate change. Uh, increasing the stocks of organic carbon in soils can also play a significant role in uh, removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere while also improving the fertility and the status of soils to support uh, production. And then also managing soils, we can uh, add biochar that contributes to retain uh, moisture in soils and also increase soil fertility while also uh, sequestering carbon in the soils. And then we are now recently looking at seaweed uh, farming as a scalable solution that contributes to generate a product of value in many sources, but also at the same time contribute to support carbon sequestration in the ocean. So the, the earliest uh, contributors to nature-based solutions were all based on managing plants and seaweed. But more recently, we're also looking at the opportunity to manage animals to contribute to support nature-based solutions. And for instance, Ralph Shami and his co-workers at the International Monetary Fund released a paper two years ago where they calculated that if we were to rebuild the stocks of large whales in the ocean, then that alone could contribute to uh, remove about uh, 0.8 petagrams of carbon per year, which is very remarkable. And uh, this will be done directly by increasing the stock of carbon locked in as biomass of whales, but also through the role of whales in pumping carbon and enhancing ocean productivity and the delivery of carbon to uh, the deep sea, where carbon is sequestered and locked away from exchanging to the atmosphere. But the young whales, we can also restore the abundance of many other large marine animals, which abundance has been declined, uh, declining over the past uh, 100 to 100 years. And in doing so, we can actually enhance the, the contribution of large marine animals and rebuilding the stocks of large marine animals to uh, nature-based solutions and removing carbon dioxide. So uh, if we now look at the family of nature-based solutions, the first uh, proposals were actually made just about 15 years ago uh, based on afforestation and the billion tree campaign was uh, launched then blue carbon and conservation and restoration of mangroves, salt marshes and uh, seagrass meadows was also added 
as a new member to the family of nature-based solutions, followed by management of agricultural soils to increase organic carbon stocks in soils. Still with farming proposed in 2017 to also be an important uh, strategy to uh, sequester carbon in the ocean and the ambition of a forestation program also multiplied a thousand times from a billion trees to a trillion tree campaign uh, last year. And now we're also looking at a rebuilding the abundance of marine life as an approach to increase the family of nature-based solutions and the power of these to contribute to remove. But very importantly, uh, nature-based solutions, in addition to doing the job of uh, removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to achieve our climate goals, it's also a value-added strategy. It helps to build adaptive and resilient uh, systems, but it also contributes across a broader slate of EU and sustainable development goals, because this uh, living carbon uh, generates a lot of uh, benefits for humans that contributes, contributes to alleviate poverty, remove hunger, uh, propel sustainable economic growth and sustainable cities and communities, responsible uh, consumption patterns improve, water economies and water management, biodiversity on land and oceans, and of course, climate action. So uh, many nations are now looking at nature-based solutions as key underpinnings of the nationally uh, determine uh, contributions to uh, mitigate climate change and achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. Thank you for your attention. Thank you all to all our esteemed uh, panelists for this uh, these great presentations and these will uh, kickstart a great discussion. Uh, if we can uh, start uh, with you, Adam. Uh, energy transition pathways may deliver continued economic growth, universal energy access per UN SDG 7, climate change mitigation per SDG 13, and decarbonization targets per the Paris Agreement. To balance these ambitions, the world eventually needs to move to zero carbon emissions while ensuring economic development. What role do you see for oil and other hydrocarbons in this zero carbon world? Will extraction, transport, and combustion be possible without accumulating more greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere? Uh, thank you, uh, Noor, for that question. And uh, my video has been turned off by the host, and perhaps they can start that uh, for me. Uh, the uh, there we go. Thank you. The If you, if you simply limit yourself to uh, reducing uh, use of oil and gas as a way of accomplishing uh, the reduction in greenhouse gases, as I indicated earlier, you, you risk a number of very serious problems. Uh, one is uh, hard to decarbonize industries. The second one is uh, uh, the sustainable development goals at the United Nations of hundreds of millions of people that don't have access to electricity or clean energy uh, for cooking, for example. And the third one is the economic effects of premature abandonment of infrastructure. I think that there are, you know, coming back to oil, with a number of technologies that are under development now, oil can continue to be used uh, in a very uh, environmentally friendly way. I think that, that uh, there's a phrase that carbon is not the enemy, it's fugitive carbon uh, that is the concern. Uh, living carbon in, in nature, as uh, Carlos was discussing, is, uh, is valuable. Durable carbon uh, is uh, where it's locked up is uh, not harmful, and finding ways to make sure that carbon remains durable is, is a useful application of technology. So coming back to oil, I think that there are uh, going to be uh, opportunities through uh, things like direct air capture um, and 
and enhanced oil recovery of, of ways to continue to use oil in those places where it's needed and coming from those countries who depend on oil uh, for uh, their uh, own economies uh, to do it in a way that's friendly. And I think it's very possible, uh, Nora, uh, and I'll stop with this comment, that uh, approaching the uh, issue of dealing with climate from the standpoint of enabling all of the options uh, is going to prove to be easier to do politically and less expensive uh, for consumers uh, than uh, kind of focusing on uh, single approaches. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, and I'd like to encourage the audience to submit their questions through the Q&A chat. We did receive a couple of questions. Uh, please keep them coming. Uh, Dr. Gassim, if I can bring you to the discussion. Reducing CO2 emissions drastically will require the participation of the hard to abate sectors, such as oil, gas, aluminum, iron, steel, cement, and petrochemicals, as well as the heavy transport, which includes heavy duty road transport, shipping, and aviation. Combined, these compromise a total of 37% of CO2 emissions. Reaching acceptable temperature thresholds cannot be achieved without first reaching emissions neutrality, coupled with significantly ramped up efforts to deploy and use negative emissions technologies. In turn, these goals cannot be achieved without moving hard to abate sectors towards sustainability, circularity, and neutrality. Can you talk about the technology innovations options across the four Rs in transitioning hard to abate sectors toward carbon circularity and neutrality? Sure, and uh, thank you, uh, Nora. Um, I think uh, when we were really uh, tagging a circular carbon economy as a, a comprehensive uh, framework uh, and approach, um, I think part of it is really uh, that uh, comprehensiveness, if you wish, uh, in uh, including all the sectors. So there is really no sector uh, to kind of be lifted uh, in it. But also uh, recognizing that uh, different sectors have really different, I would say, dynamics, uh, requirements, and a, a, a kind of a maturity of a technology and the visibility, financial visibility is really uh, also uh, a very key uh, factor that we would really need to, uh, to consider. So that is where we are really saying uh, it is four hours and uh, you get to get started uh, at what is kind of suitable uh, for that particular sector. Um, Funding and enabling would come to play to support those, and we call it among ourselves, the less fortunate uh, sectors that really needs to get the, uh, the support and leave those that are really mature and having the technology uh, do it and get to start it. So I will give an example and maybe I will end with that. In the roadmap we have put for the implementation uh, for uh, the CCOS uh, uh, through the, the, the framework, we started immediately with those already commercialized available technologies within those sectors that are really easy to abate. And they have really significant, if you wish, uh, emission to be abated. At the same time, we injected, or planning really to inject, because this is something that we are really finalizing and working on, uh, the enabling for those hard to abate, because we believe that they need really to be bridged and brought to that same level, like those that are really already uh, matured and ready for them to abate. So cement industry, very hard to abate. Utility industry, very hard to abate. Today, the technology is not there. So you need really to kind of help them with some of the technology uh, and that will be really costing much higher than their ability 
for them really to do it alone. So that is really when the enabling uh, aspect really would come for you really to bridge. But you need really to do it in order for you to encourage that maturity of the technology and applying it because it will never really happen before you kind of push for it and put it into practice. So that is really the comprehensiveness that we are really putting. Over the time, as it really mature, it will be kind of then withdrawn and leave it to kind of a natural, I would say, adaptation, uh, if you wish. And that will really help to uh, kind of get every sector uh, being taken care of. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gassim. Indeed, uh, the hard to abate sectors are uh, difficult to uh, abate. And uh, this is one of the advantages of the circular carbon economy is that it, it allows the participation uh, of these sectors. Um, if I can go to you, Dr. Ahmed, uh, there's a question from uh, Juan Jose Gil Fernandez. How efficient is hydrogen combustion in relation to natural gas combustion? How much energy is lost in hydrogen combustion in comparison with natural gas? Thank you, Noor. I think I'm uh, not sure if everyone saw that, but I answered that, that hydrogen has actually about 30% of the energy content in methane or natural gas, which means, you know, if you think about it uh, from a, a kind of a physics perspective, you need approximately three units uh, or cubic feet of, hyd of hydrogen to deliver or produce the same energy of one unit of natural gas. So I think that's, that tells you uh, uh, about that energy content. Thank you very much. And if I can move to you, Professor uh, Carlos, you, ca you coined the term uh, blue carbon and described the coastal ecosystems as hidden forests of the biosphere. Can you talk about the potential of blue carbon in mitigating climate change? Yes, thank you, Dr. Nura. That's actually a very appropriate question to celebrate a World Ocean Day, uh, which uh, we are celebrating today. And for decades, we had overlooked the power of the ocean to contribute to solutions. We were called them a hidden forest, the role of marine habitats in uh, sequestering carbon uh, and also defending our shorelines. So um, uh, in this uh, context, uh, when we aggregate the mature components of blue carbon uh, strategies, including uh, seagrass, talmarses, and uh, mangrove conservation, and restoration, we calculate that the potential to contribute to the uh, net uh, removal of uh, greenhouse gas emissions will be about 3% of all the effort required. But when we add uh, other components that are emerging that are also ocean-based, then the scope uh, raises to maybe 10 to 15% of the global reduction in greenhouse gases that will be required. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Carlos. Adam, there's a question from the floor to you. The policy package includes all policy instruments, pricing, regulation, direct investments. However, these policy instruments overlap. Once the pricing instrument is implemented, regulatory imp instruments may not be needed. Please clarify. Uh, well, that's a good question, uh, Nora. I think that, uh, first of all, having a value on carbon certainly makes uh, it a lot easier to understand the economics. Uh, how, that, uh, how that pricing mechanism is constructed, though, uh, is, does not have a general agreement uh, globally yet. Uh, there, are, uh, there are ways to create a price, in a sense, through a regulatory action like cap and trade. Uh, some uh, policymakers have called for taxes. Uh, I think it's uh, pretty clear that a variety of methods are likely to be employed by different countries, depending on their national circumstances. And some of those uh, could involve things like a regulatory approach. It might uh, involve uh, a, a pricing approach that, that uh, has a tax component or maybe does it. It might even uh, involve things like uh, uh, direct support. Uh, this is done, for example, in the United States through the tax code in uh, encouraging carbon storage through the 45Q section of the tax code. So I think that the point of mentioning all of these uh, uh, items 
uh, that uh, were raised in the in the question uh, is that uh, that all of these instruments, whether they're pricing or value related regulatory instruments or other financial ways of encouraging uh, adoption of CCE technologies uh, are uh, likely to be employed in different places at different times. Back to you, Nora. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, we just uh, received a question here. Uh, maybe I can pose it to, to you, Dr. Gassim. So uh, when will the CCE technologies be widely utilized and economically viable? This is by uh, David Williams. Another question on CCUS, the world will need 140 times the storage available today. How can the world deal with such a challenge? Is there perhaps any research to reduce the volume of CO2 once it's pumped inside? Well, uh, uh, thank you, Nora. And uh, um, I think maybe both questions are really kind of interlinked because um, currently uh, the effort, uh, at least from our real perspective, is really to uh, verify uh, the storage uh, capacities uh, that we have really got because we do believe that the whole world is not going to be really in short of uh, storage, but there are really a lot of effort that needs to be really put on uh, verifying L capacities. And along with that capacity, there got to be really some uh, other, uh, I would say, associated requirements on those storage. The safety required in there and uh, the kind of the sustainability of that storage and uh, kind of ensuring uh, no leakages that would uh, happen. And there is no also really communication happening um, between different uh, kind of uh, reservoirs that is really being bombed uh, in uh, uh, this CO2. So there are really a lot of uh, technicalities that needs really to be done. Now, uh, when um, I think it is really uh, a question of um, uh, uh, the implementation the research focus and uh, this is why we said in our approach we are starting with three groups of uh, technologies if you wish some that are really in the r d because we would like really to push it forward we'd like really to uh, develop it further uh, some that are past already the lab if you wish uh, and the kind of the initial uh, stage uh, early trl and it is really to be pushed into the scaling up uh, for, for it. So this is really another group that we are really working on. And uh, those that are really ready, uh, just really expanding using them. So uh, probably there is no direct answer for uh, the when, uh, because really it is a matter of uh, maturity of that technology, implementation of it and adaptation for it. And we are really very much keen in uh, pushing in all fronts. Uh, when it comes to uh, el, el technologies for el, uh, sequestration or storage, um, uh, I think the focus for us is really not only uh, on uh, reducing the volumes that are really uh, uh, happening uh, and underground, mm -hmm. rather really to focus on the capacities that we have got. And uh, uh, as I said, all early indications are showing that there are huge, huge storage capacities scattered all around. And I can talk uh, for Saudi Arabia. Uh, I think we are really blessed with a wonderful ge ge uh, kind of geological formations in uh, most of the country uh, that will really help us to sequestrate uh, and be really maybe a, a kind of a leading uh, a country when it comes to uh, carbon uh, storage, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gassam. Uh, if, I if, if I can move to you, uh, Dr. Ahmed, uh, on hydrogen, which is seen as the Swiss uh, knife uh, cross-cutting solution to carbon circularity and neutrality. The world has seen the first shipment of blue ammonia from Japan to from Saudi Arabia to Japan. Uh, can you talk about the potential of, um, uh, of uh, using fossil fuels for uh, clean hydrogen? It would be important to have the blue hydrogen uh, uh, use where it's produced as it becomes very expensive to transport. So why does the 
uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia not think about producing electricity from blue hydrogen in the vicinity of where hydrogen is produced and then exporting the clean energy, replacing the fossil fuel powering electricity production. Thank you, Nora, for the question. This is a great question indeed, actually, if you look at today's market, most of the hydrogen produced today is really coming indeed from hydrocarbons. In fact, with, as I showed in my presentation with more than 90% uh, hydrocarbon as a source for hydrogen production, we can uh, see that really this is for a reason because of an economical reason mainly, right? So uh, I agree. Uh, and I, actually, in fact, uh, we have already demonstrated uh, a great example of a circular carbon economy by producing uh, a natural gas-based or hydrocarbon-based ammonia uh, while capturing the CO2 and utilizing that CO2. Part of it was actually utilized for the production of methanol and part of it was uh, utilized for EOR applications in one of our fields here in, in Aramco. Um, so this concept really uh, is all about circularity and circular carbon economy. And with the reference to your question about the production of hydrogen or where, where the, where it's, where the uh, basically you ship the hydrocarbon, we have indeed thought about that as part of our discussion within the development of the circular carbon economy framework. We have also looked at different options for transporting our hydrogen uh, or ex exporting our hydrogen from the kingdom to the potential markets via the hydrocarbons, actually. So one great example is to ship that hydrogen within uh, by shipping LPG, for example, to a potential market, produce the hydrogen by reforming that LPG or even natural gas in the market and capturing the CO2. Then you can liquefy that CO2 and ship it back. And you can actually utilize or leverage the same ship or tanker that used to uh, carry the hydrocarbon or the LPG to, to the market. So by, by going through that option, we really indeed save that cost of the transportation, which is very energy intensive process, uh, whether you transform it or transport it in a form of a liquid hydrogen uh, or uh, other carriers like uh, MCH or even ammonia. Uh, ammonia seems to be actually the most feasible option uh, right after the hydrocarbon in terms of the uh, commercial, uh, commercial uh, competitiveness. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, uh, for this uh, wonderful overview or on blue hydrogen. Professor Carlos, if I could go to you. There are people uh, working on ocean sediment uh, and they are trying to estimate how much ocean sediment capture is possible. Can you talk to us about the potential of this in mitigating climate change? Yes, thank you, Dr. Nura. So that's uh, an attempt to again extend uh, blue carbon approaches to uh, beyond uh, the habitats that I highlighted, uh, because these habitats only occupy 0.2% of the seafloor. So then the notion of uh, managing carbon in the rest of the seafloor has emerged. And for instance, uh, trolling uh, for fishing has been shown to disrupt uh, carbon stocks in sediments and therefore lead to emissions. However, the scope for uh, managing sediments beyond uh, the coastal area to uh, mitigate emissions is probably uh, limited. And my uh, recommendation on this emerging interest is to focus on uh, hot spots for uh, carbon, such as uh, fjords and the deltas of uh, large rivers where carbon stocks are very large and therefore protection might uh, yield benefits in terms of reduced emissions as well. But this is uh, still, in, uh, in the early stages of research. And there's now a number of international programs that are going to be looking at options to manage sediments in continental shelves to also reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Duarte. Um, Adam, if I can uh, pose a question to you, what are the potential impacts of the circular carbon economy and how can uh, they be harnessed and unlocked? Uh, well, uh, Nora, I think that it might be interesting to, to say, what are the potential effects of not implementing the circular carbon economy? Uh, there are a number of people who see the circular carbon economy as a uh, kind of uh, being advanced by oil and natural gas uh, 
producers as a way to uh, to defer or deflect uh, the focus on banning oil and gas. If you think about, uh, again, the concept of the circular carbon economy as, as it was endorsed by all of the G20 countries, including a number of, of consuming countries, uh, is integrated and holistic. What it says is not it does not say don't reduce. It doesn't say of, uh, avoid efficiency. It, it doesn't, it, it's a positive approach. It says use every tool in the toolbox. If you're building a house, you need more than just a hammer. You have to have many tools to, to create a, uh, a true path and an affordable path towards uh, net zero. The coming back to, to the idea of you know what what is at the heart of this view? It's it's quite simple. What it says is that if you try to concentrate on any one of the four R's, whether it's reduce, reuse, recycle, or remove, you're probably raising the costs. So you want to use every tool in the toolbox to try to make the transition to cleaner fuels affordable. And, and I think that you could say that if you don't move in this direction, including uh, the nature-based solutions that Carlos talked about and the geologic uh, solutions that, that uh, involved in EOR uh, that Ahmed uh, discussed and Gossam, then you're, you're losing uh, kind of the opportunity to increase the rate of, of, uh, of sequestering and storing carbon. And, and, and that raises the cost to consumers, makes the whole thing much, much harder from both an economic and political standpoint. So I, I think that it's, uh, you know, I, I think the question is really sort of interesting. It, it's more along to me, I think the question that I would ask people in, in our audience today is what solution that actually helps you achieve the Paris Agreement do you oppose? Uh, why would you oppose any solution that actually moves you towards the goal of net zero? Back to you, Nora. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, if I can go back to you, Dr. Gassim, on um, the four R's of the CCE. So um, uh, people who often uh, hear about uh, the four R's, I mean, re reduce and remove are, are pretty straightforward. But for reuse and recycle, can you talk to us about the incentive uh, to reuse and recycle? I know you mentioned, you know, in addition to enhanced oil recovery, you mentioned CO2 for, for industries, particularly that. Without a price on carbon, what would be the commercial incentive for companies to... Um, to reuse and recycle carbon? Um, uh, sure, uh, uh, Nora. Um, well, I think uh, we are coming from uh, maybe different angles. And uh, I like what uh, Adam mentioned earlier. Um, the carbon is not the en uh, enemy. Uh, I think it is really the emissions that we are really trying to, to uh, carbon is really very useful thing for us and we do have a lot of applications for it. So one angle, we would like really to look at it when we are talking about reuse and recycle is really to put an effort to uh, make a utilization uh, of, uh, of in the CO2. And uh, maybe to the point of uh, Adam, just uh, in the previous question, uh, it's a tool uh, there and uh, why not use it? Why not leverage it? Uh, if the technology is there for you to be able to convert CO2 to chemicals, uh, if you are able to uh, uh, purify CO2, for some of your application, well, food and beverage, uh, for example. Uh, if you can use this CO2 for uh, uh, curing concrete that you need for uh, infrastructure, uh, if you can uh, recycle it, if I can use it for 
some of the industrial applications, uh, and there are really many. Um, why not? Now, linking it to the point you have really mentioned on enabling it, and I think this is really the key. If we liberate ourselves from saying, no, this is only a problem and it, there could be really a solution, that is when we would be really more than happy to uh, uh, enable, uh, fund, support, and incentivize uh, these kind of applications that will help us reach to our goal. Uh, I think we do have one ultimate goal, which is the net zero. Uh, and uh, for us to reach it, we are really open for all tools that would really help us. And I believe the recycle and the reuse are really great. And there would be more and more uh, utilization within these two uh, pillars if we really supported technology. Uh, we do have really some already uh, available technologies and um, at least in utilizing el, el, el carbon cured uh, concrete is one of uh, the cases that we are working here in Kingdom and we are uh, putting some support towards really making it happen. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gassim. And Dr. Ahmed, if I can quickly ask you, how can we reduce the price gap between brown, gray, and blue hydrogen and green hydrogen? The price gap is quite big. Yeah, well, I mean, honestly speaking, I mean, if you look at all these colors or options, I would just link them or map them to a time frame of development, right? So if we would like really to develop an, this market and let this market evolve, we have to start from the cheapest options or the available options. And now, as I mentioned earlier, blue hydrogen seems to be really, the blue color seems to be the shortest term because this is where we need really to leverage our existing assets and leverage the excess. Uh, I mean, speaking at least from uh, uh, the kingdom's perspective, our access to, uh, let's say, a competitive price of feedstock, uh, our access to, let's say, high potential storage locations for CO2, all of this, uh, all of these factors, in fact, put us in a very competitive position compared to other suppliers of hydrogen, at least for the short term to take charge and, and basically uh, grab a, a significant share in this evolving market. And actually, actually, we will be the ones who enable and build this market for, for future colors of hydrogen, right? So green hydrogen is also uh, coming, uh, but then I would say uh, not anytime soon uh, as electrolysis uh, capex needs to reduce uh, dramatically. Uh, let's say beyond 2030, then it will be uh, competitive. Brown, I mean, if you speak about gray hydrogen, it's available today, it's competitive, but then there are also different market requirements. Uh, some markets will, will only accept carbon free or, or low carbon hydrogen. And this is where we need, I, I see all of these hydrogen colors complementing each others, but then the price will, will, will evolve and, uh, by time as the technology uh, gap uh, become smaller and smaller. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. And if I can yeah. pose the last question to Professor Carlos, you talked about nature-based solutions as a great potential in mitigating climate change. How can we accelerate this momentum? Uh, thank you, Dr. Nura. So uh, in my opinion, the science basis is uh, very mature for most of the components, mangroves, seagrasses, and salt marshes. And what is missing is a clearing house that brings together the owners or proponents of the projects with those who are willing to invest in those projects. So often I, I uh, speak at forums where there are investors that are looking at available uh, blue carbon projects at scale and they're a bit frustrated because the projects that are brought to their attention are very small and do not meet nearly 10% of their investment needs. So in fact, I am aware that there are uh, very large projects that might become available, but we are lacking that uh, marketplace to bring together investors and uh, proponents. And also it's very important that the blue carbon projects involve local communities because they will be the main beneficiaries and should be involved in the execution of the projects as well. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Duarte. And I'd like to thank uh, our esteemed panelists for a great and wonderful discussion. Thank you to our attendees for joining us at the first IAEE online conference of 2021.